Today we're talking about the scanner. And I know I've done a video on this already, but I wanted to hit up a couple of uh, more in-depth expert level topics specifically on setting up the scanner and some of the special features, so stick around. Hey everybody, welcome back to the garage and uh, I want to start off by thanking all the new subscribers. The floodgates are open. If you haven't hit the subscribe button already, hit it. You don't want to miss out on all of this data. It's coming fast, it's coming hard, it's good information to have, especially if you're wanting to learn how to tune, if you're wanting to bust, you know, brush the cobwebs off and get better at tuning. The information is getting out there. People are using this and having great results, so don't miss out on it. And there's also some other cool stuff like the Super Auto, which is a smoke monster still right now, but we've got a fix in the works, and so here in a couple days, that thing will be back out on the road, so stick around. But for now, we are talking about the scanner. I've got it opened up here. Uh, you should be able to see the big things that we're looking at right now is the PID list. We touched on this in the past. I'll throw a link up in the corner for the original scanner kind of setup, but I want to go a little bit more in depth on the PID list. We set that PID list up before we do any logging. You know, we connect to the vehicle. It gets the parameters that are available for the vehicle to let us know, hey, these are the parameters that you can choose from to set up to log this vehicle. Now, you got to fight the urge to go out and add too many PIDs. Right now, this list probably has too many PIDs. This is a great list for going around and checking the health of a vehicle. But when you're actually tuning specific things, you want to minimize the different PIDs that you're using. And there's a reason for that. So if you think about the way that data is transferred from the ECU through the... Uh, the uh, HP Tuners module or the EFI Live module to the computer, you have a message link that is trying to cram all this data in. And it can do all this much data within a certain time period. Well, if each block, each PID takes up this much space and you keep on adding, once you exceed that message link, then you have to have two messages. So it takes twice as long to transfer the data. If you exceed that one, then it takes three times as long to transfer the data. So the idea behind that is, is the least amount of data that we are transmitting from the vehicle to the software they should have the highest resolution data points. We should be updating the data as fast as possible. And if you load out your scanner PID list, you will start to get slow data. And that's not the best way to tune. So if you're tuning your math curve or something like that, get rid of most of the PIDs that you use for speed density tuning. If you're doing speed density tuning, we're not concerned about what the math hertz is at that point in time because we're not, you know, doing any tuning that surrounds that. So a lot of that stuff, you know, the torque parameters, we don't need to tune that whenever we're doing fueling tuning. You know, we probably don't necessarily need to, it's good to keep like timing in there across the board whenever we're doing all this other stuff so we can look for knock retard and stuff to make sure that we're not uh, getting knocked. But at Spark Advance, we don't really care about tuning Spark Advance or logging Spark Advance while we're doing our fuel tuning. So those are just things to take into consideration while you are setting up your PID list. So let's take a look at some of the other features real quick. Now we've got open our window for our math parameters. And this is something great. You've seen me use these in the past to set up AFR tables, stuff like that, or to do custom math. Uh, you can do this stuff to do horsepower calculations. You can do it uh, for injector duty cycle, all these different things. There's a lot of formulas out here, and this is where you plug all of that in. You know, one of the big things that you want to do is pay attention to what your uh, PIDs are and what your decimals are. And then whenever we use these math parameters somewhere else, it is logged to the uh, the logical number of the math parameter. So we have 10 user maths. And if you set something up on user math five and then come back at a later date and try to open up a table that's using that, it's looking at user math five, not necessarily what is in there. In this case, it might be boost or EQ ratio. So if the, if you move those maths around on this user list, it will affect any of your graphs that you have built out. The other cool thing about it is, is with the math parameters, we can come down to the chart down at the bottom and add math parameters in here. So if you right click on that and to open up your charts layout, you can see that this boost one is using math user. And it's basically manifold pressure minus barometric to say that once we get over barometric pressure, we are in boost. Uh, 
But the cool thing about that is if you're logging barometric pressure and manifold pressure from the get-go, from the onset, you can come back after the fact, plug this math into your graph at the bottom, and actually see the results of that math on a log that you've already done. As I said, we are using those PID blocks, we are filling those PID blocks with log data, and then we are doing post-processing, basically, as a representation on the histograms and the graphs that we see below. Okay, let's talk about filtering. Now that we've got some data loaded up, I've got a data log over in the corner. I'm not sure when it's from, but I've got my spark advanced table in here. And say I only want to see what spark is being advanced whenever I am not giving it any throttle. So what we would then do is look at the accelerator pedal position and apply a filter to that. Let's go ahead and open up the graph settings on this so we can do the filter. So now you can see that we have this opened up for Spark Advanced. There's the filter box over there. What we want to do is add a new variable. And that new variable is going to be our existing accelerator pedal position that we have already been logging. And then what we want is we want to say, as you can see in the filtering box, we have accelerator pedal position there. We want to say whenever that is less than, say, 1%. So if we do a less than one, we are now 1% because this is in percentage. And if we come back, this is all of our time in advance on this table that has been applied whenever the, there is no pedal input. Let's go back and look at beforehand. We can open this back up. Take that out. And there's our full spark table. Now let's say, well, what if we want to see how much advance that we had only under full throttle? We'll add that PID back in, but now we're going to flip our direction. Now we want to say accelerator over 90%. Well, as you can see, there's only a couple spots that are being hit where the, the pedal is to the metal in this situation. That's just kind of the basics of how we use filtering. This is a great thing that we can do where we can go back and add post-process filtering to specific things to make sure that the values that we're generating on our histograms are within the means that we want. So say that we're out logging something and find out that we maybe left our O2 sensors on where we were going into closed loop. You could go out and filter out any of those cell hits that were made while closed loop is active. Okay, now that we're connected up, we got a couple options up here. You probably already know about the diagnostics where you can read in and clear your DTCs on there. Look at your uh, readiness monitors to make sure that you're good if you're trying to clear uh, emissions. Freeze frames, I mean, not really anything that we use that often. This just kind of grabs a uh, snapshot of all of your current um, parameter readings in there. So I don't ever use free frames. I'm sure there's a reason to use it. It's just not something I've ever seen the need because once you have the log or you have the ability to do logs, freeze frames are kind of an antiquated way of approaching things. But the other thing we want to look at is the vehicle controls and special functions menu. I'm sorry that we're beeping here. I know that's probably driving a couple of you crazy, but there's nothing we can do about that as long as we're recording this. Uh, actually, I take that back. Let me try this. So we got the special controls or the controls and special functions here. And these are some great things that you can do. There's a lot of stuff in here that you don't necessarily need to mess with. But some of the things that we want to look at is idle control. I like to use that every once in a while. There is a parameter in the uh, log or in your actual tuning file that you can max this thing out. And so it's normally set to like 1100 RPMs. I think I've got mine bumped up to 1500. And so every once in a while, if I'm trying to get the vehicle up to warm, I might bump the idle up off the standard eight or 900 RPMs to 1100 RPMs. Uh, there are some special use cases for that. Uh, same ordeal with kind of throttle position, stuff like that. But some of the big ones that we like to use are the fuel tab. If you have forgotten to disable closed loop on your tune and you want to go ahead and pull log, you can disable closed loop right here. You can command it off and it should hold throughout the time until you do a power cycle on it. The other one that we want to do is the LTFT, not necessarily the learn. We always want to disable that whenever we are doing speed density tuning or map tuning. But the reset, whenever you get done doing speed density tuning before you, after you flash in your new speed density tune, before you go out and start looking at that data again, you need to reset your LTFTs. That's after you've put your closed loop system back in place and you're using your oxygen sensors. 
The reasoning behind that is, is that there is a map out there that we don't have access to that has fuel adjustment uh, cells on it that is based off of the switching of your O2 sensors. And if you go out and do speed density tuning and then re-enable closed loop without resetting this, as soon as you go out and drive, your scaling is going to be off. Your fueling is going to be off and you're going to be like, what the hell? I just went through this process of doing speed density. Why are all these numbers wonky again? That's because you did not reset the LTFTs through the scanner. Whenever you do transmission changes, transmission tuning, a lot of times you'll see people say that you need to go out and do a, a trans fast learn or a reset. Uh, you've got to be aware that there's some of these that if you go in and, and we'll touch on this later in some of the transmission tuning, if you go through it, there's a specific PID that you have to log that will tell you to go through a shift pattern. And so if for some reason you click on one of these and it's the wrong one and your vehicle will not go whenever it's in drive, don't freak out. The quickest way to solve it is to re-download your tune and that will take it back out of uh, uh, trans adapt reset. So I've been there before whenever I thought, oh man, I've really broken something now. But that's something whenever you get into trans tuning that you will have to adjust your adapts or uh, reset your adapts because what that does is your uh, trans solenoid pressure, whenever we make adjustments to that, is kind of like the short-term and long-term fueling. It will try to bring those things back in line or it may make a corrections off of previous tuning that you've done. So we always want to reset those after doing a trans tune. The other one is commanded gears. Once again, there is a parameter in the tune file that has to be set up for this to properly function. So if you're going out there and you're hitting the dyno and you want to command fourth gear, there's no real way of holding it unless you go into the tune, set that up beforehand, and then you can come in here, get it to fourth gear, and then hit command fourth gear, and it should stay in fourth gear throughout the full pull. And so that's about it for the scanner. You know, we touched on the basics of it. This one touches on a little bit more of the advanced features in there that you can look at, how it does the data processing, how we can do post-processing to existing data, existing tune files, things like that. So if you have any questions, feel free to hit up the comments below. Uh, if you're looking for specific parameters or custom user math, let me know. I can try and help you out with some of that stuff. Same more deal with histograms. If you got a specific histogram that you're trying to create and for some reason you're having issues, let me know and I'll help, you know, go through how to create the histograms. And I've done a specific histogram uh, video on the different speed density histograms for multiple platforms. That should be available in the tuning uh, uh, playlist, which there will be a link down below. But say if you haven't already, subscribe, sign up. Let me know if there's something you want to see. Keep your eyes peeled for the uh, next Super Auto video. I've got a scavenging pump coming in, I think, tomorrow. So in the next couple days, I'll be working on that. Hopefully, the next video is us ripping some boost out there. Uh, if you haven't checked out the Patreon page, hit that up. There's some uh, special behind-the-scenes features on there that's only available to patrons. And uh, as always, thanks for stopping by the garage. Now let's see if I can get out of here without knocking my camera over. Uh...